Good uh, morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome for uh, this webinar of the KBVE SFD. I'm Thibaut Duboval. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you for our first event of 2021, um, a digital event, of course, since we, we adapt to, to the circumstances. Um, we'll have a very interesting uh, event today with presentations from uh, our chairman, uh, Frédéric Duneau, who will uh, uh, come back about the, the news uh, uh, regarding the organization and the, the upcoming events. We'll then listen to Raf uh, Steyart and Alban von Ranst, who will uh, uh, talk about the e-review that is already available on our websites. And then we'll have the chance to, uh, with François Vallée, discover the winner of the CINEV Award 2020 with the presentation of the, the winner afterwards. Uh, of course, uh, you will be able to ask your questions uh, to the speakers um, with the question tab on the right of your screen, um, and the speakers will be able to reply privately to your questions. Also, you uh, will have the chance to review um, the, the session thanks to the replay that will be available right uh, after our event today. Let's start with Frédéric. Direct welcome on stage. Frédéric is um, the Chief Officer Customer uh, Market and System at ELIA and also the Chairman of the KBVE SRBE. Frédéric, welcome. Thank, thank you, Thibault. Uh, good evening to, to all of you. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome you today for the, for the first uh, webinar of uh, 2021. And it's also what we will uh, call the kickoff of this year. It is already uh, end of March, but we, we organized basically our first event uh, uh, today. Uh, I hope you are all in the good health uh, in this difficult uh, situation. It's also my hope that uh, we will see the end of the tunnel in the in the next in the next weeks of let's say let's, let next months. Um, and I have to say that the last 12 months were quite special for uh, for all of you, but also for us as uh, an association uh, to to reinvent ourselves. It's also an opportunity uh, with the, the the webinars that we, uh, like we see today uh, that has been reinvented uh, in, in use also in our uh, association. It was not the case before. It has a new tool for us also after the COVID uh, uh, periods, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's also a time that we use to uh, think about the future of the association, how we want to to evolve uh, in uh, in the next years. Uh, one of the uh, elements I can already confirm uh, this uh, that basically the our mission is uh, is not changing. Huh? Uh, it is still even in in an even complexer uh, world. Our mission is still to share information with our uh, members uh, regarding the energy transitions, and to focus also on technical activities, on market activities, cross uh, cross uh, 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 company, and to enrich basically the discussion between us by networking and, and trying to understand uh, which are the difficulties or the challenges of the different part of the supply chain in the uh, energy uh, transition. When we uh, discussed about the uh, repositioning of the of the association, we took basically four main trains into into account. Uh, the first one, I, I'm pretty sure it's not new for, 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 uh, for the people here on the table, it's almost already nice to uh, to uh, uh, repeat them, uh, renewables integration. That's the first one, and that's uh, that's an important one. Huh? When you see the evolution, uh, even in Belgium, huh, when we speak about 2050, we speak about 10 to 15 gigawatt of of wind. We speak about 30 to 50 gigawatt of solar, and that with a peak load of around today uh, 14 14 gigawatts. Quite quite impressive. That's the first one, renewables integration. Second one is internationalization. Uh, to solve the the, 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 the the challenges that we have for operating the systems, the international cooperation is even more important than in the past. We have to collaborate at all the time uh, uh, spent uh, uh, time the time schedule in the in the in the operation from year right to, to to real time, and it will intensify in the in the next years to have a safe operation of uh, of the system. Third element, decentralization, uh, a major uh, uh, way to decarbonize, like it is basically foreseen in the, in the grid, to decarbonize completely 
uh, the energy system is to electrify as much as possible. And it does mean we will see a lot of electrification in the mobility sector, in the building sector, in the industry. And it does mean also it will be more decentralized. Uh, and then again, operating the system with millions of uh, active assets will be quite more challenging than with a few centralized uh, power plants. And then we have to organize a paradigm shift that is not no more the production following the load, but is the load which will have to follow uh, the production. And there, quite important, the fourth uh, pillar and uh, the digitalization, uh, which will help us to solve all these challenges by helping us to interact with all these small and decentralized assets to support the safe operation of the system. But this means the ecosystem uh, around us as electrical companies will, will evolve a lot and the cross-sector cooperation will become more and more uh, important in, comes in the future and that's what we consider also when reinventing the future of uh, KVB and SRB. And I come to, to the five main pillars we, we have identified to uh, make the evolution of the SRB. And I will come back more in detail on this one uh, in the first of, in one of the first uh, presidential uh, meeting we will have probably in the second part of, of this year, because they are still to be fine-tuned with the uh, boards of, uh, of, the, of the association. But I can already say these five main pillars will, will play a key role. Uh, the first, diversity. Huh? It is not only uh, Belgium, uh, but it's also at European level that we have to uh, look at the challenges. Uh, it is uh, not only electricity, uh, it is broader than that, and we speak about energy sector coupling. Uh, what about mobility? What about uh, eating sector? What about industries? What about molecules? Uh, all is more interrelated, and we have also to consider that in the way we will organize the events and decision with, uh, with all of you. Second pillars, uh, the events, uh, and like we see today, we, we are uh, for, for us as association also innovative and it's not only the study days like we had in the past, but it's also some shorter webinars that where we can also interact with, with you on a more regular uh, basis to come with some content, not obliging everybody to, to attend the, the study days, which will still uh, be a, a key uh, events uh, from association, of course, and study days are the major events, but you can also organize some other smaller events where we can share uh, insights uh, with, uh, with you. Academics had also a, a, a very important uh, uh, pillar in our uh, reflection uh, because the quality of the presentation, the quality of the discussions is essential. Uh, it's not just to have some uh, open and high level discussions of presentation. We want to be backed by academics to be sure we have the right level of, of, of discussions with the right quality of uh, regarding technical uh, the te te technical aspects. And we will organize uh, for that a kind of a circle of, of academics and it will have also an impact on the members of the, uh, of the board and we will uh, try to attract more professors. We have only some of them and we'll try to, to extend that to uh, new, new figures probably uh, quite known in the in the uh, electrical uh, world. And the last one, uh, team up, uh, it is also the intention, and you will see on the next slide, uh, this all, that was already, already been realized, it's also the intention to team up with other associations, with uh, other uh, companies to organize the events and to reinforce uh, each other, we as, uh, as KBB, SRB, but also the others, which can share expertise and share the, the burden to organize the events and basically proposing more possibilities for, uh, for the members. And that's the last slide before giving the floor to uh, to uh, to the colleagues. That's basically what we have planned for the uh, the next uh, the next month. And then we start today with uh, with uh, with the kickoff of 2021. But it will be followed uh, by a seminar on the balancing of the grid. Basically, three of them uh, will be uh, webinar sessions. Uh, one webinar on cybersecurity, which are, which is already planned for uh, end of uh, of April, and three very interesting uh, webinars for the energy uh, community that we will do together with uh, CIA partners. Later in the year, it will be uh, the, second, the second half and Q, Q3, uh, Q, Q4, we'll have one day on uh, uh, substations together with S, uh, SAA, the, our equivalent in, in, in France. Uh, we will also organize with uh, SAA the uh, G-Cable conference. I think it's in, in November, and we will have one study day, I hope, uh, uh, in a presidential way, on the electricity pricing. 
and quite interesting if you uh, look at, at the agenda and I'm pretty sure we'll have the opportunity to exchange on a regular basis and I really uh, look forward to meeting uh, all of you uh, in real life in presential to have also the opportunity to, to network as I, as I think it is an important part of the added value of being a member of the association. Thank you and I give the floor to Raf. And Albert. Hello. Um, first, I have to present the the the, the review A, the first uh, is issue of the review A, and uh, it was already indicated that this first issue uh, is dedicated to solar storms and their potential disastrous effect on power grids. It must be said, electricians in our regions are not so familiar with this phenomenon. I live through the issue and take first a look at the cover. On the front page, uh, you can see a somewhat idyllic image of high voltage lines at sunrise. But a closer look reveals that this is not a realistic image, but an artistic one. It represents also the sun as a huge threatening sphere in the sky. That is what this is about. At the left, uh, on, on the right of this, uh, this slide, you see also the members of the working group uh, responsible for, the, for this issue. On the back side of the cover, you can see the, the sun in full activity. It is an image of the corona, the sun's outer atmosphere, taken by a solar probe like those recently launched by NASA and ESA. You see a boiling, bubbling solar surface. Charged particles, the solar wind, escape from the sun's surface on a permanent basis. But from time to time, there are also eruptions the solar storms. Masses of uh, charged particles, plasma clouds, are then emitted. And these plasma clouds, once they reach the Earth, disturb the Earth's magnetic field and create a variation of the so-called geomagnetic induction. This variation of the geomagnetic induction, in turn, induces an electric field at the Earth's surface which leads to unwanted currents in grounded networks. Solar activity follows a cyclical pattern with a period of about 11 years. In 2019, cycle 24 came to an end, one of the weakest in almost a century. It is of course impossible to estimate how intense cycle 25, which is now starting, will be. This issue of KBV SRBA is not the first on solar storms. About five years ago, a review A was published, edited together with experts of the Royal Observatory of Belgium. That issue provided a general view of the phenomenon, a general method of calculation, and an evaluation of the risks in a qualitative manner. However, it is not necessary to have read the previous issue in order to understand the, the current one. This issue uh, counts 60 pages and includes four papers. Here you can see the contents of the papers. I indicated in yellow the key elements of the different papers and summarize them as follows. First, providing new knowledge, new insights, that's uh, paper one. Quantifying the risk based on measurement and calculation, that's uh, the subject of papers two and three. And assessing that risk, that's the subject of article four. The Sigre working group on understanding of geomagnetic storm environment for high power grids 
has recently ended its activity. Johan van Balen was an active participant in this project. And he is also, also the, the author of the first article. In that first paper, he summarized the main findings of the working group. The paper focuses on three types of geomagnetic disturbances relevant to power grids and indicates how each of them affect grids in its own way. It's important to stress that on basis of these findings, the following insights need to be adjusted. Storms do not only affect grids at high latitudes, certain types of storms can be felt at all latitudes. And secondly, not only east-west oriented lines are sensitive to geomagnetic disturbances, but also others. In fact, the variation of the geomagnetic induction due to a solar storm has no preferential direction. This in contrast to the geomagnetic induction itself, which has, as you know, a south-north orientation. Uh, a key element to quantify the effects of solar storms on power grids is the mathematical relationship between the variation of the magnetic induction delta B caused by a storm and the resulting electric field E induced at the Earth's surface. Complex and rigorous methods for determining this relationship have been developed in the literature as well as in the previous review E uh, on solar storm. Note the B and the E are phasers. This means that they have a sinusoidal form. To apply this, these formulas to general time functions, frequency time conversions are needed, which is an additional complication. In that paper, the, the, the article 2, uh, Professor Van Eck approaches these formulas so that they can be reduced to a simple relationship. I indicated this in the red frame, a simple relationship between the linear variation of the geomagnetic induction B and the electric field induced in the Earth's surface E. This simple formula is applicable to the Belgian situation, but also to other areas with a similar Earth resistivity model. In the third paper, uh, Jean-Louis Van Eck analyzes the measurements recorded at uh, the Durbe Observatory, at some Belgian observatory, during different storms that occurred during the last three decades. The simplified formula, formula of paper two allows to calculate which induced currents these storms could lead to. The final result is summarized in the table on this slide. You can see the maximum current value is reached during the storm of March 1991. And in that case, when a long line is earthed over transformers at the extremes, a geomagnetic current, uh, induced current, what we call a GIC, of 120 amperes at 400 kilovolt, occurs in the neutral grounding points of these transformers. This long line grounded at the extremes is a theoretical concept. Taking into account the particularities of the Belgian grid, the JIC value of the, the induced current value will be reduced substantially. This happens in the next paper that will be presented by the author Albert van Ranst. Good evening. The subject of my presentation is the relation between electric fields, which follow uh, geomagnetic uh, changes of induction, and the phenomena in the grid, which is itself composed of several lines. 
But here we start with the origin, as was explained by Raf. The essential point is a variation of electromagnetic induction gives a variation, gives an electric field, and an electric field which is along a conductor creates a voltage along this conductor. That's the principle for a single line. Uh, in fact, agreed. Next slide, please. Yes, a grid is composed of several lines, several conductors, which are in a grid pattern. Uh, an individual line, as explained by Raf, is just the line with two endpoints connected to the earth. The figures mentioned by Raf, uh, typically 120 amps, is for an infinitely long line, which means in a line in which the end effects are can be neglected. In practice, uh, for, for instance, in Belgium, we have relatively short lines. And then the effects of local resistance at the end and resistance of the earth towards the infinite earth are to be taken into account. So we have a, an equivalent which contains a voltage source, an internal resistance of the line and two localized resistances at the ends. At the upper right, this scheme is a little bit converted to a current source and th the reason for that is that it mathematically it is more convenient if you want to make a calculation for a complex grid with several lines uh, the current source model gives you the equivalent you see at the lower right where in each node of the network there is a current source, an equivalent current source, which represents all the connected lines, and then the lines connected to the next nodes, which have also their own current source. And if you put all these nodes together in a model, you get the nodal admittance uh, model of a network, which is quite convenient uh, and which, which is well known in uh, traditional electrical network analysis. Next slide, please. What are the important factors for uh, the, the geomagnetic currents? First, there is the orientation of the line, a line which is parallel with the electric field will receive the greatest induced voltage, whereas a line perpendicular on, on the electric field will almost see nothing. So the individual angles of the lines are important to see what are the individual voltages in the individual lines induced. The second point is the network. The network concept of grounding the network. And in high voltage, it is practice to have, well, uh, a grounding principle. You have to select from the beginning and you have to maintain it because it is the basis of all the design of the network. Uh, basis of uh, the high voltage insulation uh, of uh, fault current uh, detection uh, and so on. So on the figure on the right top, you see the equivalent of uh, the earthing scheme for a single phase fault. You see that there is the neutral point resistance you, point, you, you put in every node. Uh, the, the neutral point resistance, in fact, influences the zero sequence impedance of the network. 
That's for the alternative current part. But the neutral point resistance, as mentioned on the, the slides before, and also you see on the slide on the bottom, uh, the neutral point resistance influences also the ground currents from geomagnetic origin. And this is important, particularly in Belgium. Uh, we come later to that. The third point is network topology, and that's uh, obvious how the network is connected, where the grounding points are put, uh, all this influences the flow of the DC currents and the, actually the flow in individual neutral points. Uh, it is to be noted that for uh, geomagnetic currents, gal galvanic coupling is applicable, which means, for instance, in Belgium, that 380 kilovolt network is not isolated from the 150. They are connected by uh, by transformers, which are uh, single winding with tapping. So we could have also transformers with complete separate windings, but then still you have some galvanic coupling through the neutral point and the earth resistance, which is the voltage over the earth resistance is seen in common by both windings, both windings. Fourth important factor was already mentioned, the local earth resistance. Uh, the higher the resistance, the lower the current into that particular neutral point. But higher resistance shifts the current which cannot flow in this point will flow to other points. So influencing the Earth's resistances or changing by adding additional resistors uh, by a specific ground current limitation, it's a possibility, but you have to do it carefully because the current you take away from one point will move to another point and maybe it's even worse there. Next slide, please. What are the potential effects of geomagnetic currents? There is only one effect. It's the saturation of transformers by the DC current. And saturation has one effect you see on the top figure at the left with the magnetizing characteristic. In normal operation, the flux is symmetrical around zero and you get a symmetrical magnetizing current. If you shift by an uh, imposed DC current, the magnetizing current, the, the, the flux characteristic, you will see very distorted currents that are asked from the AC grid to maintain the sinusoidal flux variations, which are imposed by the network. This means that the magnetizing current gets a lot of harmonic components. You see on the top right figure, uh, it's from harmonic one, which is the fundamental, which is highly increased. And then you get everything up to very high frequencies. But in particular, the lower ones are most important for the network. What are the effects of this DC saturation of transformer? You get effects in the transformers themselves and you get effects in the network. The effect in the transformer themselves, the first one, which is not so serious, maybe annoying, but not so serious, it's that the noise of the transformer increases enormously for two reasons. One reason is that there is a 
50 hertz component appearing, whereas in normal operation it is a 100 hertz uh, noise component only. You get a 50 hertz component and also a very much bigger induction level and much bigger magnetostriction, which means deformation of the steel and which is in fact the link between the flux and the sound. Another effect you see in the right, no, please, the left, you see in the transformer, the flux, which is normally told to, be, to stay into the steel core, uh, due to saturation of the core, it will leave the steel core and will permeate into the oil, into the tank, into the windings and everywhere where it should not be. And this has two effects. The steel parts, which are normally not uh, subject to alternating flux, will heat up by uh, magnetic uh, heating and also by eddy currents. And then in the windings, the additional flux in the windings creates additional loss. And this is the worst effect for the transformer and has also uh, potential damage in, let's say, the scale of 5 to 20 minutes, one hour, you can damage completely a transformer due to heating of the windings. In case of severe, of course, severe saturation. Now, on effects on the networks, these are due to the fact that uh, jig current will supply a, a shift in magnetic uh, in the magnetic flux, but the AC network is to supply all the uh, magnetizing currents, including all the harmonics, which means that the harmonics have to come from the grid to go to the transformer, or you can inversely say, think of the transformer sending harmonics to the grid. And then you will see situation uh, with uh, potential parallel resonances between capacitance, which is uh, capacitor batteries, for instance, or filters, or uh, cable capacitances, combined with the short circuit power of the grid, which is inductive by principle, you get a possible resonance circuit on one of the frequencies which are available in the magnetizing current. And then you get a severe resonance. The quality factor of the grid is normally high. You get severe resonance and possible trips due to that reason. Another effect is the sharp increase of the 50 hertz component of the magnetizing current. And this means an additional megabar load on the generators in the grid. And this is not a problem as long as the pre-jig situation is such that the, you are in a stable part of the uh, voltage versus uh, reactive power characteristic you see at the bottom right. But as soon as you approach to the nose of the curve, this may simply put your network in collapse, which means total block, block, block out. And not for COVID reasons. Next slide, please. What about the Belgian situation? In Belgium, of course, we have not uh, the same length of lines as Canada or the United States. We have short lines, we have a densely net mesh network, and we have multiple earthing points. And the example at the right top shows uh, a sample calculation case. First, with a relatively long line, say 100 kilometers, put to the earth at both ends. And the second one, 
The same line, but with three intermediate transformers and connection to Earth. And what you see is that the currents, which are 250, 250 amps in, in the first example, drop to 150 and 100 or something like that in the second case, which means the overall, the, the total current of the first case is subdivided in minor currents in the intermediate points. This is beneficial for each individual transformer, of course, because it has less burden from, from the DC current. A second interesting factor in Belgium is that the utility operator, since almost 30 years, has uh, selected a uh, grounding policy to minimize the earth fault currents, but still in, uh, uh, in agreement with the general principle of uh, effectively earthed network, which has chosen for a Belgian design. But this uh, policy, which uh, was done by uh, selecting earthing locations, removing as much as possible uh, earthings where not needed, and to put in additional resistance in the earthing points. And this has uh, allowed us to reduce far further the currents of uh, the example two by a factor two. So uh, we are not longer at 250 amps, but uh, at 70 amps or something, a factor four. So, which is important, of course. And then a third interesting factor in Belgium that almost all our transformers, which are uh, with a grounded star winding, winding, have also a delta compensation winding. And this winding delta compensation uh, helps to filter out part of the harmonic currents that are generated by jig phenomenon, which is, of course, interesting to avoid certain resonances. But you cannot avoid all of them, but it reduces. Next slide, please. In summary, is Germanic, Germanic effects are a threat, a threat for the Belgian grid. Well, uh, Raf has shown geomagnetic currents in the table of 120 amps. Uh, we can say if such a current was to flow into the earthing of uh, the 380 to 150 kV transformers in Belgium, it would damage them within that's less than an hour. So there is a warning. Uh, the magnetic recordings show the possibility of high currents that are potentially dangerous. But this was a theoretical calculation. We have never made uh, up to now a detailed analysis of how the currents flow in the Belgian network and what is the actual uh, current absorbed by each of the transformers. So up to now, if we look at the practical experience over the years that the Belgian grid exists, we have never seen any damage or a dysfunction of the Belgian grid due to an, a, a documented geomagnetic event that is identified to happen at the same time. So, for our, from our point of view, we can consider that the threat is rather low. Now, if further analysis shows that we should do anything or we would need to have more vigilance, then uh, there is still room in Belgium to, for further mitigation actions. For instance, 
we can uh, actively manage the neutral point resistance. For instance, for the moment, it's not a case. So there is still possibility. And further on, uh, pro probably there will be a warning system from the satellites that now are turning around the sun that could help us to minimize the danger of a uh, announced uh, geomag geomagnetic storm. So far, this is my contribution. Thank you very much, Albert. Thank you very much, Raf, as well, for the very interesting presentations. Um, as a reminder, the, the full study is available on, on uh, the websites of the association. So if uh, you want to know more about the topic, uh, uh, we invite you to uh, directly go on the website to get your, uh, your full study uh, online. Let's now welcome uh, Francois Vallée to talk about the CINAV Awards. And uh, then we'll have the pleasure to welcome the winner of, uh, of these awards who will present the, the thesis uh, 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 that he realized uh, one year and a half ago. Welcome, Francois. Yeah, thank you, uh, Thibault. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. So it's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce uh, the CINAV Award uh, laureate for uh, the, the year 2020. So before, before giving his name, uh, I would like to mention that uh, the jury received really uh, outstanding works uh, to be analyzed uh, this year. And so it's uh, again a clue of the, the very high level uh, research that is conducted uh, this year in, uh, in Belgium in the field of electrical engineering. And so it, it's really a, a good news this. Uh, so, uh, but to come on, on the laureate, so um, the, the winning work uh, is dedicated to a very hot topic in the current energy transition and is dealing uh, practically uh, with the development of ultra-fast uh, algorithms for the protection of HVDC links. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the author of this work is uh, Willem Le Terme. Uh, so, uh, Willem uh, is um, currently um, a senior researcher within uh, University of Leuven and Energieville. Uh, he did uh, an, his master's degree and his PhD degree at the KU Leuven. Uh, and uh, during his PhD, he joined uh, the University of Manchester to, 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 develop, to further develop uh, his PhD work. And uh, after uh, getting his PhD, he was also a collaborator within the Imperial College uh, in, in London. So Willem's uh, main field of interest are, of course, uh, the, the protection of uh, HVDC link, but also uh, the electromagnetic transient modeling, uh, especially uh, in HVDC link. So, uh, Willem, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations for uh, this award and this well-deserved uh, award. And so I will now leave you the floor uh, so that you can introduce in further details uh, the content of your work. So congrats, Willem, and the floor is yours. Okay, um, so thank you very much, um, Professor Vallée. And I would also like to thank the jury members of the CINAVA Award for showing the, their appreciation um, for the work that I have done. Uh, and in this presentation, I will briefly uh, present the contents of my PhD thesis. So, yeah, in light of the decarbonization, uh, the power system is facing a huge transformation in the coming decades. Uh, the European Commission is estimating that they will install about uh, 300 gigawatts of offshore wind. Uh, and that is 15 times more than that is uh, installed as for today. And so in their document, The Clean Planet for All, they conclude that there needs to be a further focus on the timely completion of the trans-European energy networks. Now, for the electricity network, um, we are not going to rely on the AC system only to, um, well, to achieve this interconnection of uh, renewable energies. So, 
especially offshore, the AC system has some limitations in the cable lengths that it uh, can achieve. DC technology that does not have this, um, these limitations. And so HVDC grids, they have the potential to become, let's say, the uh, trans-European energy network that is needed to um, connect these renewable energy sources to the load centers. Uh, for this DC technology, we have to use voltage source converters to transform the AC into DC. And um, these voltage source converters, they work on a constant DC voltage. So that makes them suitable uh, to put them into parallel, so to put them into a meshed HVDC grid. Now, the voltage source converter technology exists for about 20 years. But actually, we have uh, seen a huge development in the, past, um, in the past two decades. So on the converter technology, the efficiencies of such a switched converter, they, they have increased from 96% to about 99%, so reaching an accuracy uh, close to that of an AC transformer. And on cable technology, well, currently, um, the cables can actually um, withstand 640 kilovolts of DC voltage. So that's also suitable for a transmission level. So actually we have the DC technology um, to efficiently transport power over large distances. Now to go to a HVDC grid, there were some main barriers. So and one of these barriers was the protection of this HVDC grid against uh, short circuit faults. If a fault occurs in an HVDC grid, we see that the fault current shows a very fast increase. So in the picture that we see here, we have an increase of um, 10 kiloamps in about 10 milliseconds. And um, the fault current goes to a high steady state value. In the meantime, we don't have any zero crossings, so we cannot use traditional AC breakers to interrupt this fault current. By contrast, the um, power electronics in the converters, they cannot withstand high overcurrents for, um, for a long amount of time. So that means that we have to um, interrupt the fault current within the first few milliseconds. So to recapitulate, what we need to do in case of faults is, if we have a fault, then we need to detect it using the voltage and the current measurements put at each end of the cable. Then we need to identify the faulted line so that we don't, uh, well, that we don't unnecessarily trigger breakers or that we don't shut off a larger part of the grid than is needed. We need to open these breakers and then we can resume operation. And all of this has to happen within a few milliseconds. Now, at the start of my PhD, ABB had solved a part of the puzzle. So they had developed a first prototype for an efficient HVDC circuit breaker that had an opening time of two, millise two milliseconds um, within the blink of an eye, which um, they commercialized it themselves. And it could interrupt nine kiloamps. So that's suitable for HVDC grid protection. But there was um, still a main question. So how will we use these breakers? So this was the main topic of my research. So we, need, we needed efficient means to analyze DC side fault currents in extensive HVDC grids. There was also the question of the choice of HVDC system grounding. So we can go for a low impedance grounded uh, system or a high impedance grounded system, each with their advantages and disadvantages. Um, and then also a large part of my PhD, I spent on algorithms that could achieve selectivity and fault clearing. So that could detect and identify faults in the sub millisecond time range. And also to provide backup functionality in case that a breaker fails so that we still take um, corrective actions. With respect to the fault analysis, um, what we need was actually an efficient model of the converter. So the main source of fault currents is actually through the HVDC converter, so coming from the AC side. Now, such a power electronic converter contains a lot of switches and is controlled by a lot of complex uh, control loops. And this makes it very inefficient in a time domain simulation. 
um, reduced order models were developed, but then the main focus for these models was on control interactions and not so much on the protection itself. So in my PhD, I have developed a converter model that is suitable for DC fault analysis, and that is really dedicated to DC site protection studies. Uh, the advantages of the model were that actually almost all of the switches were excluded and that almost all of the control loops were also excluded so that we have really an efficient model. And by comparing the results of this reduced model to a very detailed model, we found that we could actually get a very close match. Next, we need um, primary protection algorithms for these HVD secrets. So that means that we need to detect and identify faults in the millisecond time range by using the voltage and the current measured at one line end. And we need to discriminate faults on the line um, from faults external to that line. So fault F1 is an internal fault, which we need to discriminate from fault F2. Now, for this fault discrimination, we could actually make use of the weakness of a DC circuit breaker. So each DC circuit breaker requires a series inductor to limit the rate of rise of the fault current. So it has a maximum um, interruption capability. And if we don't limit the rate of rise of the fault current, even within the two millisecond opening time, the fault current would have exceeded the breaker capacity. Now this series inductor also offers a means to discriminate um, faults at both sides of these uh, inductors because they actually act as a low pass filter combined with the cable. So you can see this clearly in the voltage because for a fault, an internal fault on the line, we have a high, um, let's say a high TVDT while for a fault um, external to the line, so fault beyond this inductor, this um, slope of the voltage is very much lower. And we can use that in an algorithm to discriminate between those faults. What we found was that the voltage signal was more robust to, um, let's say, to develop our algorithms on than the current, but we still use the current to determine the direction of the fault relative to the relay. Finally, we also needed backup protection algorithms that could determine whether a breaker had operated or not. And um, these graphs show, let's say, two currents and two voltages. So one for an uncleared fault, so for a fault that is not um, properly interrupted by a breaker. And this is the blue curve. And you can see that actually the blue curve ends up with high currents and low voltages and one curve for a fault where the breaker has um, acted correctly. So you see that the breaker has driven the fault current to zero and has actually achieved um, or has actually driven the voltage back up to nominal values. For these algorithms, we could look at the traditional AC approach. And in this approach, we wait long enough so that we know that the breaker should have reacted and then we measure the current. So if the current through that breaker at that time is zero, we know that the breaker has acted correctly. If it is not zero, we know that it has failed. Um, now in a DC grid, every millisecond is of importance because every millisecond the fault current is increasing. So it is of importance to detect breaker failure as soon as possible. And in my thesis, I have proposed an algorithm that can detect breaker failure even before the, um, the current through that breaker is, um, is zero. So the proposed algorithm has the advantage that you can react uh, much quicker. Um, after the PhD, there was a follow-up. There were follow-up projects. So there was a huge European funded project. It was a 40 million euro project. Uh, it was called PROMOTION, which is an acronym for Progress on Meshed HVDC Offshore Transmission Networks. It contained a lot of industry partners and KU Leuven, uh, let's say, KU Leuven Energy Bill contributed a lot to the protection part. So, one nice thing that we achieved was actually a practical implementation of the algorithms on a real hardware prototype. 
So in my PhD, I have focused on the theory. And in this project, the, the question was like, OK, can we also develop this, um, this protection equipment in real life? And does it function fast enough? And well, the good thing is the answer was yes. So we implemented the algorithms on a relay, by, um, which was hardware from Mitsubishi. And we tested it in the National HVDC Center in Scotland. Um, and you can see the picture of us uh, standing with the relay. So in this, um, so in Scotland, um, the tests of the relay showed that we could um, achieve operating times in the order of 100 microseconds. So it is certainly fast enough. Another follow-up work uh, stems from the fact that um, converted technology did not stand still. So new types of um, VSC converters were developed. And these new types, they could actually remain in control even if the DC voltage is not stable. And by remaining in control, you can also actually actively control the current to zero even if there is a DC side fault. So also for these types of um, converters, I developed a reduced model, which um, let's say has very limited components. So you can see the schematic in the top right. And um, by comparing the results of that reduced model against um, the results obtained with an experimental hardware setup, we found that actually with a very reduced model, we could already achieve a high accuracy. Finally, um, the HVDC grid should not be built by a single vendor. So there should be interoperability between multiple vendors. And that means that standardization is required. Now, the IEC, so the International Electrotechnical Committee, has um, acknowledged the need for standardization in HVDC grids. And they have created two ad hoc working groups. And one is on HVDC grid um, protection and well, with, um, with the colleagues within KU Leuven and Energyville, we are actively contributing to one of these ad hoc uh, standardization groups. So in conclusion, HVDC grids can facilitate the deployment of massive amounts of renewable energy sources. And my PhD work has contributed to a fundamental understanding of fault phenomena and HVDC grid protection. And to bring this presentation to an end, well, eight years of protection research at KU Leuven and Energyville shows that protection should not be a barrier towards constructing HVDC grids. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Willem. Uh, and again, congratulations for uh, this uh, award. It is um, now the end of uh, our webinar. Just before uh, to let you, uh, I'd like to remind you the uh, upcoming events uh, and already in April with the, the, um, the webinar balancing the grid and the study day uh, cyber security. Um, if you're a member, you will already receive the invitation uh, by tomorrow uh, in, your, uh, in your email. Um, if not, you can of course join us um, uh, still throughout the, the website um with the, the membership that you can uh, see here and also uh, if you're a company you can still uh, support the association and we are of course available to to discuss it uh, with you if you want to promote uh, so your activity uh, thanks to the uh, the association um of course we are also available on uh, uh, the social networks as you you may have seen uh, during the last uh, weeks uh, so feel free to contact us uh, there or uh, through the info.kbve.srbe.be uh, email address if you have any questions regarding uh, the award, regarding the review, or regarding the membership. Thank you very much. Um, see you soon. And of course, take care. <laughs>